my little bobble here while we get the slides up and running. Um, I want to look at uh, sources of law, ancient and modern. Um, there's a slideshow. We'll go. Um, anyway, I sometimes worry about whether I should give this lecture or not. Um, it may or may not inform students, but I think it's important for us to trace back that the law is not something created by Congress yesterday. Uh, the law is a very old um, and basically comes down to three or four very simple uh, ideas. The reasonable person standard, the duty of uh, good faith, um, you know, that in business dealings we do things honestly. Uh, and uh, I can't think of the third. That's basically it, okay? So let's look at some of our early codifications. And you'll see that I am a PowerPoint wizard, uh, not. We begin with the Code of Hammurabi. You may or may not have heard of this, but uh, Palmer, uh, Hammurabi was a clerk in the court of Perses, um, or Xerxes, I'm sorry, Xerxes, Z-X-E-R-X-E-S, -E -E in Mesopotamia, uh, of Babylonian. And what he did was actually created on stone tablets, well, actually, yeah, uh, and we can still see them. They're, they're still excellent. I don't know that we have all of them. Um, but he basically wrote out all the rules uh, and included in that you know, while we get, if you steal, we'll cut off your non-dominant hand. Uh, we also get the code merchant, from which uh, we will see elements of our modern uniform commercial code. Now, the other guy, uh, and the, well, anyway, I guess I blew it here. We might also look at Leviticus and Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. These are very much uh, codes. Um, you know, if you want to read them for nothing else, you know, don't eat shellfish, don't eat cloven hoofed animals. Um, there are some uh, health prescriptions about, you know, when to have sex. Um, uh, you know, it's, uh, kinda, it's pretty interesting uh, stuff. Um, the next one is, and I finally fixed the spelling, Kung Fu Cha or Confucius, as we know him. And there he, there he is, a very humble man. He said, I didn't come up with anything. All I did was study the ancients. So what we oftentimes look at as old is even older than we thought it was. Confucius, um, I believe time frame is 2,500 years prior to Christ. Uh, maybe I've got it wrong. And uh, Hammurabi is eight or nine hundred years prior to Christ. Um, but Confucius's teachings come in, and you can see bits of them in the Code of Hammurabi. They're important to us because there was a, a Macedonian by the name of uh, Alexander who um, conquered most of the known Western world at the time, his armies went all the way to the Ganges in India, which is quite a major feat because it means he they conquer they crossed the mountain ranges of Pakistan uh, to reach the Ganges. They were turned back at that point, but he went back. But as Alexander had conquered Persia, which was an an incredible feat at the time, the Persians were the dominant military force. They were kind of the Romans of the day. And um, there's a lot of our modern uh, civilization that comes from the Babylonians and the Persians and the others, uh, you know, not wonderful people necessarily. But anyway, Alexander and his clerks found the Code of Hammurabi and brought it back to Greece. And this is important because the Romans, within a few hundred years, conquered the Greeks. So we had the great Greek civilization of Aristotle and Socrates and uh, all the other names, Solon, uh, if you read Parallel Lives, um, and now I'm blanking on his name, um, uh, great book, of Parallel Lives, hopefully the author's name will come to me. Um, 
Uh, he studies Romans against Greeks, and one of the great people in there is a fellow named Solon. Uh, but he talks about Archimedes. It's the great biography of Ar Archimedes, and they're only like 30, 40 pages each parallel line. Um, but uh, oh, I may have to go look it up. Um, it's anyway. Um, wonderful writer, wonderful writer. Modern translation is really pretty cool. The reason Roman law is important to us is that eventually the Romans conquered all the way up into England. And they brought their laws with them. You look at the Pax Romanica or Pax Romana, uh, it is essentially that we put an end to tribal warfare in Europe. Um, and although the Romans were terrible oppressors, they also gave very straightforward law. And you know, a lot of what we did, as I talked about in an earlier lecture, our House and Senate representation is very Roman in its oranges. Um, anyway, once the Romans were defeated by the Visigoths and the other big tribes of uh, Europe, we go into the Dark Ages. And the Dark Ages are we don't have any enlightenment. The, the Romans, for all their bad I, bad things, did wonderful things in terms of art, construction, um, you know, uh, water systems, all kinds of great things to which we owe, um, you know, the, the Romans were really the fabulous people. Um, as we come out of the day, Dark Ages, we're not going to shift our focus to England. Remember that the Romans conquered France, too. We'll talk about the French in a little bit. But um, what was happening in England around 900 A.D., Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, was that the Danes were coming over uh, as Vikings and raiding uh, England. I believe the way it worked is they kind of started at York and worked their way south. And what they would do is every year they they go to York, they land, and they go, okay, we're here to collect our Dane gelb, gold. You pay us money, we won't rape and pillage. So they went there, down, 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 down. Well, eventually the British, who were at that time broken into five major kingdoms and a majority of small kingdoms, somewhat like the city-states of Italy and Germany, before the consolidation of those countries in the 1800s. Italy, I believe, is 1861, and then Germany followed suit in the 1880s. So actually, Germany and Italy are really kind of pretty new countries. Um, they're ancient in their origins, but they were all these city-states with small fiefdoms and all that kind of stuff. <coughs> well, what happens is there's a fellow named Alfred who comes in and I believe he was king of Mercia, which was the dominant country at the time. Um, and there was Wessex and Essex, or Wessex doesn't exist, and Sussex. I don't really know my ancient uh, British uh, kingdoms. My daughter knows this stuff better than I do. But what Alfred did is he went to the other major kings, and he said, why don't we unify and fight these Danes? They did that. They beat the Danes back. And eventually they also got the Danes to agree that, look, whatever you've captured, we'll let you keep. You can keep it as your property, but be you want you inside Denmark to swell fealty, swear fealty to us. Now, if you look at tribal movement into England, you can see that the Jutes, the Angles, the Saxons, and a whole bunch of others moved, because it's only about 60 miles from the far western uh, countries of uh, Denmark, the far western islands, to England. It's not a very far sail. Um, you know, even I might be able to make that in a sailboat, even in a lightning, which is my old one. Um, you know, so, what is it, 12 miles from uh, Calais to Dover? It's not very far. So even though England's an island nation, it was invaded and taken over by a lot of these other entities. Well, after Alfred the Great, who unified the crowd, crown, we then see a whole bunch of Danish kings went on, and then we get into a more orderly 
tradition where we begin to take mostly British uh, uh, people. Of course, we get to William the Conqueror very soon thereafter. But, uh, oh, I see. It. Anyway, uh, I haven't gotten to, who's this guy? The Venerable Bede. Bede is a churchman who worked under Alfred. And what Bede did was create something called the Doomsday Book. And that book listed all the land and all the title in England so that tax scoff laws could not be, uh, they could go get them. Hey, you owe taxes, you owe this land. And they, they began to regulate the system of moving land so that if you owned it in the Domesday book, you could not sell it unless you went to a local registrar and registered the sale. Of course, they can get taxes on that and all that kind of stuff. But that way we know if we go to bring up armies, we know who to go to to get the soldiers. This kind of leads us to John, and it is not John of Gaunt. I apologize. This is, uh, I believe these are bad links, too. Um, uh, yeah, this one may be, this one may work. Um, yeah, this is the Magna Carta, and there's the original item. Um, I don't know that it has. What I like is the translation. Um, let me see if that shows up. Um, no. Nothing like watching somebody struggle. We need it in modern. Uh, oh, there's the English translation. So here's translation of the Magna Carta. It's written in Middle English, so it's a little. Um, it's a little hard to read otherwise. Um, But I, I want you to look at it because um, we're going to be looking at, all right, let me just read it. John, by the grace of God, King of England, Lord of Ireland, Duke of Normandy, and Aquitaine, and court Count of Anjou to his archbishops, bishops, abbots, earls, barons, justices, foresters, sheriffs, stewards, servants, and to all his official and loyal subjects. Compare Magna Carta to we the people. Big difference. Here we go. King has all power, now begins to cede power to the people. Um, so what we've got by the transformation into the American system is that we take what the British gave us, because we're an old former British colony, but we now say the people had all that power. The king doesn't. We're throwing the king out. We're giving it to the people. The people can now decide what to give to those who would have power over them. Um, that's essentially what happens in the Magna Carta. We could go on longer, but I think we need to look at some of the other stuff that goes on in British law or English law. First thing is the Star Chamber. This was utilized by Henry VIII and what it comes from. I don't have a picture of it in this one. Um, what it comes from is uh, the court of Wolseley, uh, who was the chancellor for Henry VIII, is Hampton Court. And you can actually go see the Star Chamber. If you were summoned, summoned as a royal to the Star Chamber, chances are you were going straight to the Tower of London, which is a trip up the Thames River. And uh, the Tower of London has a port right there that all these royals actually lived in an ancient castle built by William the Conqueror. Um, I skipped over William the Conqueror, but William the Conqueror came in and claimed through, when we look at the Court of Anjou, uh, that's 1215 uh, is when the um, Magna Carta was signed. And the reason, let me back up one more. I did have more. I wanted to talk about that. 
The reason we got to this was that John was abusing the tax process. His brother, um, Richard the Lionheart, on the Second Crusade was, was captured by a German prince, a, you know, one of these city-state guys, and uh, locked up with a huge ransom, I think it was 10,000 marks, which is a lot of gold. That is an incredible sum. And he essentially bankrupted Britain in order to get his brother back. And John got the short end of the stick here historically because Richard is considered this great savior of England, and John uh, uh, is given lower ranking. There, there's also a great play by Shakespeare, King John, which doesn't focus on the Magna Carta, but talks about the relationship with uh, John and uh, France. Um, it's a fabulous Shakespeare play, and it's usually a big pageant. But what we get in the Magna Carta, let me see if I can, I don't know that I can get back to that. Uh, did I get there? Yes, maybe I can. Um, if we look in the Magna Carta, we will see that what um, that what happens is we get a movement away from power of the king. So I can't really find lay my hands on this. So let's not try to do that. That's pretty silly. Um, where is my slideshow? All right, so we'll go back to our slideshow. I thought I selected something else. All right, we're moving. We're almost done. Um, anyway, the Star Chamber led to the Tower of London. But one of the things we see in the Magna Carta and thereafter is the creation of circuit courts. And we still have these. There's the Circuit Court of the City of St. Louis. I think it's the circuit court of the county of the city of St. Louis. Uh, there's the circuit court of the county of St. Louis. And if we look out at all the uh, Missouri counties, and I'm not going to go there, uh, we can see how this plays. But for instance, Abraham Lincoln rode the eighth circuit in the state of Illinois. So he went from Ottawa to a couple of other towns, Champaign, I believe. Um, and uh, when, you know, basically the court would travel, the lawyers, the judges would all stay in the same room and they'd rotate beds. There'd be eight of them in a room and there would be three in a bed each time and you just rotated your space through. So you did three days in a bed, five days on the floor, three days in a bed. Um, the circuit courts took care of everything law, all right? So whatever there was in terms of... Um, written out law mostly about trespass to property property rights were really the primary thing that's what the courts took care of the problem was they wouldn't cover everything so what we would have was we would have suits in chancery which is the chancellor of the exchequer the chancellor of the exchequer would hear things like, um, well, divorce wasn't legal, but that's what's come out uh, is uh, it's suits in equity, the balancing of what is fair. The law was very rigid, and now we've kind of, we've now moved it to where we combined chancery and law together. But as early as, you know, we don't really see that completely separating out until almost the 1950s or later in the United States, and we still hold on to certain of the things in equity. And, and divorce is kind of the best one for us to talk about now. You could not get, legally, you couldn't get a divorce. So that's where, under the old days, you would actually maybe go to chancery. We can't live together anymore. Please help us separate our property. Make it so that one of us has uh, rights over the kids, blah, blah, blah. And the chancellor would uh, maybe take that under. Um, we've, I just gave another lecture on how legislation worked. These were all acts of parliament. They were written in the name of the monarch. Um, 
And then what would happen is we would get the common law. So the common law would develop little bits of, uh, and I think I've covered this in others, uh, have, would develop little bits of, you know, you stole my fox or you got onto my land or uh, whatever. It would take certain facts and then try to match them to the current facts of this case and give a result that was the same so that we would get very predictable law. Chancery can sometimes be, oh, who knows what's best, this seems best, we'll try to keep acting that on. And I think you can see it, that over time we needed to kind of merge them together. So these are things that in our Constitution are preserved to us. We get the British common law. This is, don't take this away from us. Don't have states creating new legislation. The common law at the time was considered a, you know, a real bulwark of freedom as well as a bulwark of uh, um, property rights. And as I talked about before, the birth of plenty requires something like the rule of law, the common law. Um, now, this is a quick explanation of how the American system got to us. It ignores a lot of the other stuff that is coming in, one of which is the Napoleonic Code, which we find deeply embedded in Louisiana, because it's an old French area. The German Civil Code, which is very much Achtung, you will obey. Uh, you have to do things this certain way. Uh, ordinarily, it's gotten a little more flexible lately as it's been put into the EU. But generally, German civil code is a forbidding code. When we look at American law, it's like, well, you can try anything once, but if it hurts somebody else, we may punish you and draw a line after the fact. The Germans tend to go, no, we know that this is wrong. Here's what you have to do. Very, very code structured. Um, when I first created these slides, um, around 2005 or thereabouts. This one bears date of 2014, but it's a modification date, um, I think, or 2008. It really looked like the EU was going to be the dominant legal force in the world going forward. Well, the financial crisis hurt that big time. And, you know, particularly the pigs, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain heard it, uh, and Ireland was in there too. It was two I's, P double I G S, as those countries all struggled to recover and Ireland's doing okay, the others are not, um, the power of the EU worldwide diminished. The other thing that's definitely missing from this lecture is what about south of the hemisphere? With the exception of Australia and South Africa, everything else tends to be Spanish or otherwise colonial. So what we find is, you know, as, as economists and others study ethics and uh, um, pl best places to do business, they find that the former colonies of the British Isles have a more ethical system than the below the hemisphere uh, Isles like, you know, I think... Uh, we talked about in another lecture that, you know, in Peru, you need 300 government signatures to transfer uh, property. This is a payola system. The, the Spanish legal culture may be one of the reasons that they're struggling. Same thing in Greece. You know, a lot of this is payola, payola, payola. Um, but the countries like Kenya and South Africa and Australia that and India that had uh, British law and adopted British law after the British left are in a much better state. Um, is it a perfect system? No, it's a human system. It's meant to be human. It's meant to grow as we grow. It's meant to be contested. Um, it is an adversarial system in law. We have one side against another, but we tend to respect the ancient systems. You know, we tend to look at, well, here's what the law was. Here's why we might want it to change a little bit. Anyway, um, kind of a long trip from Beijing and Nanjing all the way to, uh, um, you know, Bozeman, Wyoming. 
but uh, or Bozeman, Montana, you know. But we're all beneficiaries of this of the ancient Roman conquest of England.